Welcome back to Mom Nation Unscripted. Now a word from our sponsor. Hi, it's Marilyn and Bruce of Montage Duo. We are a versatile musical act that performs music from the 1940s to today. We cover a wide range of musical genres and styles, including classic rock, pop, country, funk, blues, and even a little jazz. So, if you're looking for professional quality entertainment in the greater Phoenix area, either for an intimate acoustic setting, or a rock and full band sound, Montage Duo will please you and your guests, engaging them to join in the fun by providing an interactive entertainment experience. For more information, visit our Facebook page at Montage Duo. Well, hey, Mom Nation. It is Mom Nation Unscripted. And we are at, I can't even believe this. I say this every single episode. It's probably getting annoying at this point. But I cannot believe that we are on season four. So season four, episode seven. And today is, I'm really excited for today's guest. We are going to have an inspirational story by a local mama, and I cannot wait to hear her story and and talk about her journey. But before we get into that, ladies, holiday season is like right upon us. Like we are on top of it. Anybody feeling the pinch yet? Oh my goodness. It's so (laughs) stressful. It's my favorite time of year, but also a very stressful time of year. And for those of you that don't know, I get to celebrate both Hanukkah and Christmas, which means not even really double the shopping, but it's like nine times the shopping because Hanukkah is eight <laughs> nights of gifts and it's a lot. <laughs> I, oh, I have to tell you, so Jenny came over last Friday night with her girls and we made sugar cookies with the kids and my mom. And it was super, super fun. But Jenny got me in trouble and didn't realize that she got me in trouble. So Uh let me just reprimand you a little bit right now, my friend, because my son says to me the next morning, well, how come our elf doesn't bring us a gift every single night? (laughs) Ours does not bring a gift every night for the record. He did like once. (laughs) He was under the impression that that uh, your girls get a gift every single night from the elf, but he must be, it must be the Hanukkah stuff that he was getting confused with. That must be what it was. No, they did, I think, their first night because they came a little late. Um, They didn't come on time this year, so when they came, they brought the girls a puzzle, like as a, we're sorry for coming a week late (laughs) gift. Oh, I got you. I got you. So I can go back to my son now and be like, it's because Jenny's elf is misbehaved. (laughs) <laughs> That's why. Exactly. Yes. Yes. It was an apology gift. They don't get a <laughs> gift every day. In fact, my girls have gotten a letter from the elves saying, you need to listen to your parents a little bit more and start behaving because we're reporting back to Santa on your behavior. <laughs> Too funny. All right. So I'll, I'll clear that up with my son because the next morning I was like, oh, damn it, Jenny. I love you, <laughs> but my goodness. <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, how about you, Cher? What's been up with you this week? Um, we finally got the Christmas lights outside finalized and lit up. Um, we're traveling this week, so that's fun. Um, and we actually have a great view of the golf course up in Scottsdale right now. So I'll have to <gasps> share great. that with you guys later. I'm going to have to come and crash your party. How's the hotel? Um, beautiful. Come stay. We need to drink Thursday night, <laughs> Wednesday night. Any night? You don't have to tell me twice. (laughs) That sounds good. I could use a girl's night out for sure. Stuff's been crazy lately for me. I I get on here every single episode and tell you how nuts my life is because of work. It really is the truth. And then throw holidays on top of that. And my husband left town for, I don't know, I don't even know what day it is today. So like four or five days he was gone and single mom in it. You two, like, I don't, I don't know how you did it. I don't know how you did it. I was a single mom for like four days. Two of those days I had to deal with homeschool. I have my mom here helping me doing most of it, right? And here I am all super stressed out. So kudos to the single mamas out there. I mean, my heart goes out to you because it is not an easy job. Nope, not at all. 
Yeah. yeah. They're like, yeah, you said don't you miss that, those right? days. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? I think the difference though is, is when you do it for a few days, you don't get to get into your own routine. Whereas a single mom, it's your life and you're right. used to not relying on anyone else. So I think that's the difference. Like if you had to do it long term, you're, you are good with routine. So I have no doubt you'd fall right into place. But when it's a temporary thing, you don't get your routine down. So it's a struggle. Yeah. yeah. No, that. That's a good point. Another struggle I discovered, and actually now the absence makes the heart grow fonder quote may, means a lot of sense to me or makes a lot of sense to me because all of a sudden like the garbage wasn't getting taken out and I had this <laughs> mound of garbage and I'm like, what the heck is this? I don't even know what this is. And the dog hair wasn't getting vacuumed up on a, you know, a regular basis and magically happens when my husband's home. So <laughs> please come back. I'm so glad you had a good time, but don't ever leave again. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Anyway, without further ado, I am super excited to introduce you. This is a friend of mine. I told you ladies, I have just, I think we met what last year? Has it already I been a year? So. Yeah, which is crazy. It is. Jenny and I were just talking about that before <laughs> you hopped on. It's like, we go to bed, we get up, rinse, repeat, and it just seems like it's go, go, go all day, all day, all day. Yeah. Um, awesome life of a mom, although I would not trade it for anything. I know it sounds crazy how I sit here and kind of complain a little bit, but it's the best job ever, isn't it? Yeah, it's is. super true. Yeah. But, and we have to hold both of those things. Like, it is really hard. <laughs> and it is pretty awesome. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so Jess, tell me a little bit about you. And actually, before we get into that, tell me about Same Here Mama, because I don't know very much about that and would love to learn a little bit. So take it away, my friend. So Same Here Mama is an online community um, to provide support for chronic illness mama. So um, I call it spoony motherhood. <laughs> um, so mom who, moms who are dealing with chronic conditions and motherhood, so two full-time jobs, and having to find the balance between those two, and um, just talking with friends and just my own personal experience, I've learned that there just are so many moms going through this type of, navigating this type of life, navigating chronic illness, but we kind of do that in our silos, and motherhood in itself can be kind of isolating, so um, Same Hair Mama is like a place to bring those two things together, and um, hopefully create a community that helps highlight other women's stories and bring support. I love that. So is it a Facebook group or how do these moms get together? So right now it's just me in my little internet pocket space <laughs> on my Instagram page. Um, and then I'm launching a blog, but that is a whole process. <laughs> It is, isn't it? Um, yeah, it's like way more than I thought it was going to be, <laughs> um, which is exciting. So um, it's really in the like baby stages of what I really envision and hope it can be for other moms. And um, I think filling that void for what I need as a mom and going through this experience and what I'm learning, I think other moms need too. And there is communities like this out there. Um, in that Instagram world um, where women are connecting about things like this and it's really powerful. And it's super needed. Um, yeah. I was going to call them Jerry and Shenny, but it's actually Sherry and Jenny <laughs> and I have been running mom nation for the last six years and we've seen like, you're so spot on. It's not even funny. Like we have seen so many opportunities where a group like yours or, uh, you know, um, a collection, <laughs> I guess, of, of moms that are all going through that same thing would have really benefited some of the moms throughout the years that, that we know. So it's much needed. Um, and I think you're a hundred percent spot on. There's not, there's not a good enough spotlight on what's going on with this particular group of moms. Yeah, I agree. Hopefully we can all change that. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I am with you 100%. So there must be some sort of personal story or something that inspired you to start this and to move forward with this idea and, you know, with this movement, really. So can you tell yeah. us a little bit about that? I can, but a full disclaimer. So I've thought a lot about how I'm going to kind of broach 
talking about my own personal story in conjunction with like my mission of what I hope to do with this group and this work. And some of it is just still so, um, I was telling a friend about it and she's like, it's still so hot. <laughs> like it's so fresh and, and it's still such a hot subject in my heart um, that I'm like, oh, how am I going to tell that? <laughs> um, but the, the shortest way is that I've had a lot of chronic health conditions for a long time, like since 16 and I'm 36, that's 20 years. Yeah, that's 20 years, <laughs> which that in of itself to say is insane. Like, how can you be struggling with something for 20 years and only just now be unearthing like what the root is happening? But apparently that's very common. Um, and so it kind of all culminated into this big thing. <laughs> um, three months after I had my son, my second son, Tristan, um, and I just got very sick. So it started with being physically sick. Um, like I lost function of the right side of my body. Well, the right side of my body went numb. The My left leg kind of dropped and stopped working a little bit. <laughs> um, I My body just felt like busted. <laughs> like it just It kind of just stopped working. But honestly, that was after four years of having getting like all kinds of random diagnoses um, after having my first son. So it was like this four year process that really culminated, but it also was affecting my mental health severely. Um, I was having really intense OCD and I had been dealing with that for four years. Um, I had postpartum OCD now knowing I've had OCD for 20 years. <laughs> um, so I, all of that just got really intense, the OCD, the anxiety, and it culminated in me getting, seeking some mental health support, um, but also hoping that that mental health support in an inpatient setting would address my physical health as well, because it got to like a crisis situation, what it felt like crisis to me. Honestly, it wasn't, wasn't as bad. See, this is so raw to talk about, but I talk about it because crazily enough, as weird and as off base and how much shame my story gave me, the more I started to talk about it, like there are actually women in communities that I'm in, like Facebook groups and things like that, where their story almost identically mirrors my story, which is heartbreaking. And it made me so angry. <laughs> um, because as I was seeking this support, um, I thought that the care would be able to provide support for my physical health and my mental health. Cause I kept saying like, this is connected. I know, <laughs> I know something is wrong. <laughs> like, I know that my OCD is out of control. I know that I'm so anxious. Like that I can barely function, <laughs> but my body is also breaking down. I can't walk the way I used to. Like I can't take care of my kids the way I want to. Um, and in that kind of experience, we found out that um, I actually was having a thyroid storm or thyroid toxicosis, and the place where I was getting treatment missed it. Um, they actually found it and didn't treat it appropriately. And so I went home like on lots of interventions <laughs> um, to address the psychological components, but very little, almost nothing um, to support the actual root cause, which was I was having a thyroid storm, <laughs> which is really bad. Like, it's really crazy. So I came home and did a lot of digging to figure out what was wrong, eventually found it, eventually found a doctor who was like, mortified that this had happened, but also said in the same breath, this is very common. It's very common for people to find themselves in like a mental health setting for an issue like this. And that to me was like, wait, what? How is that? I guess common in the sense of like, it's happened before. That's enough common for me. Um, yeah. And um, so anyway, that seems insane, right? That seems like this insane story, but it really sparked staying here, mama, because I remember sitting in the Chick-fil-A with my friend <laughs> and our kids just playing around the Chick-fil-A and me just sitting there and being so enraged <laughs> that this happened, but also so numb about it and just being like, I can't let this happen anymore. This can't happen again to more women. Like, 
And that's where I am. So that's so, like the raw part of my story. Hopefully it gets less intense after this. <laughs> no, I mean, that was, I'm, I'm so sorry that you went through that and you had to go through that to get where you are now. I'm, I'm so, I feel for you so, so deeply on that. Um, but can you explain a little bit what a thyroid storm is? So maybe get into yeah. the details of kind of what was actually, um, you know, what was actually doing the damage there for you? Yeah. So um, if we look back at like that long history, like chronic illness, usually I see it's like a windy road through Alice in Wonderland's like forest <laughs> when you just, when people describe their chronic illness journeys. Um, I had a thyroid condition. Um, I was told there was nothing wrong with me. Then they found a thyroid condition. They labeled it as hypothyroidism. Well, what happened was postpartum, my thyroid got really hyper, which means like so I went from being hypo to being extremely hyper to the point where my levels were undetectable by the lab. So like less than 0 0.01, which means like it was very, very high. <laughs> so causing a lot of physical symptoms, causing me to be very sick. So that's, that's really, it's like a, a, it's thyroid toxicosis. And had I been in a hospital, I think it would have been like more like a storm. So I'm curious, were you initially misdiagnosed um, and, and maybe directed down the wrong path as far as treatment goes? or And how did you eventually get the proper um, diagnosis? So many times. <laughs> so many times, yeah. So um, yeah, I mean, it started when I was 16. So it got, at 16, got diagnosed as a mood disorder. And then at 22, after many doctor's visits, and even in the doctor visit of getting diagnosed with hypothyroidism, like in the same breath, <laughs> being told that it wasn't, I, I was fine, and that I just couldn't handle being a grown up, um, like word for word. <laughs> and then, like, getting the labs back and, like, oh, there is something wrong. And even that wasn't the big picture. And so, after, after the storm, after the fire toxicosis, just being like relentless about like, no, there is something wrong. So continuously, continuing to dig and continuing to be vulnerable, actually starting to be vulnerable and connecting with um, a couple of their mom friends and saying like, this is what happened to me because I had so much shame, so much shame around what happened. I didn't want to tell anybody, but had I not, I don't know that I would have gotten the right help or reached out to the right physician and thank goodness a physician who listened um, and identified the issue. So it was a culmination of just like being relentless about trusting my gut while also reaching out for like community that could say, oh, well, this happened to me. And wow, my, my situation looked not just like yours, but similar to yours. And this is what it was. This is what mine was. So that's how I kind of found to revisit with my endocrinologist and say like, what's happening here? So that's how that got diagnosed. I have a question. Um, so when do you feel that you know your gut, in your gut that something else is wrong and the expert isn't necessarily the expert, like the doctor, right? Because I think a lot of moms, whether it's for your kid or for yourself, are afraid to push when the doctor says, no, it's this. Even if you know in your heart, no, I don't think it is. So how do you know or how do you encourage women to do that, to stand up, to seek out their community, to seek out that advice that really helped you narrow this down? That's such, that's such a good question. <laughs> um, I think that first part is like trusting. It's so hard to trust our gut because personally, I think we're just up against um, kind of like a systemic system that makes that kind of difficult to um, assert in that environment when sometimes the responses we receive, sometimes we receive like very well-received responses. So I don't want to paint it as like, every physician is like this or um but sometimes what we receive is a very like gaslit response or using the um 
the anxiety or stress of motherhood or the worry of motherhood. Like, cause I've experienced that with my kids also like, Oh, you're just an anxious mom. Like there's nothing wrong here. Um, so I think community has always been an, a critical port, a port. It is like a port, a port in the storm kind of like, <laughs> um, it's been critical. Like that's, those are all the times where I've connected with a, another mom and the mom has said like, no, like you need to trust your gut on that. Like that sounds like a solid, <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a solid direction that does not a lot of like that doesn't sound crazy at all actually what you're saying sounds really rational and I, I know another mom that knew this or another mom that did this and so the community is huge and I think almost because of how much of that like uh, dismissing hap happens I feel like it's so entrenched maybe and it was for me entrenched in like how I navigated these appointments and how I kind of dealt with them that I had to like almost overcome that with like the support like hearing other moms be like no I think that sounds like a solid thing I don't know that I had that in myself all the time or have that in myself all the time it takes practice and that's another reason for same here mama to exist mm -hmm. Because then that way you can go back to your community that you trust. I mean, if you're all going through the same things, you're going to, you're going to have this bond. You're going to have like this sisterhood type thing. And imagine if you would have had that to come to and to just be like, all right, guys, here's what I got. I went to the doctor. Here's what they said, you know, um, and imagine just having that camaraderie. I feel like it's really important. And I'm so, I'm so glad that you've started this, you know, so that people in the future can have that camaraderie and can feel understood and not feel like anything that comes out of their mouth is crazy. I understand that space. I totally do. Um, and it, and it sounds to me and you correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds to me like when you went probably on various occasions, they just kind of said, well, here's some drugs, go home. You'll be fine. Sort of. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah. I guess it depends on the situation, but like that is a very common thread. Yeah. And all of it. Yeah. So are you noticing that um, women and moms especially are feeling more um, comfortable speaking out about what they're dealing with, with their chronic illnesses? Um, I know that I feel what I see on Facebook anyways, is there's so much pressure to show that we have this perfect life and hide, you know, the struggles that we all deal with. Do you feel like it's starting to be more normalized, um, you know, that we're not all living this perfect life? Um, are you starting to see people speak up more? I think so. Yeah, I think so. I think that there's a lot of like that, I think that Instagram community that like, you can kind of start to see that movement and shift um, inside of those spaces where I think that some of that stuff is being normalized. I think a lot of stuff with mental health is being normalized. I think that um, it starts to create like this movement within it that um, makes that a safer space to start to be more real and open and vulnerable about those kinds of things. Um, so yeah, I think so. I think, I think it's getting better. Are there any particular things that you do in terms of maybe diet or sleep or exercise or something like that, that you do on a regular basis and, and are focused on more now that you're more familiar with what's going on with you that is helpful to you? Yeah. So after, after finding out about my thyroid, I went gluten-free and that really helped. Um, and then after finding out about the mold toxicity, so I, one of my other diagnoses is, is mold toxicity, um, as well as some Cohen co-infection. So um, once I found that out, I really dug deeper into my diet and I eliminated corn and dairy and egg and sugar and caffeine. <laughs> um, and that has helped a great deal. Um, huge. And for sleep, I think just sleep is so hard. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and um, so important, which is it's so important. Right. I, I struggle yeah. too. Yeah. I think that's also very common, like along with this, also along with motherhood and like our kids jacking up our sleep forever, like our sleep cycle. <laughs> and then a lot of like with chronic illness comes like insomnia and things like that. So um, 
I'm not perfect at this, but things that help me are um, like I use a meditation app called Insight Timer and that mm-hmm. really helps. It's free. Have you guys used that before? Yeah, I've heard of that? it. Yeah. yeah. It's really cool. So it's free and they have like different um, like time durations for your meditation. So I don't know about other people. I don't have a lot of time and that is not a like thing we just say as moms like we really just don't (laughs) right um so you can do like a five minute meditation before bed and you can do like I use yoga with Adrian um just I love I love her I love her yes right so I think the the things with that is like it's very practical it's fast you can search it very easily it's not this big long thing like we're busy and it self-care is hard at all um, which sleep is not self-care sleep is critical, but like, um, it, it's hard to kind of find little routines with that. So that's kind of stuff I try. And, um, if I can't sleep, I try and do something less stimulating, but it's hard not to scroll. Instagram. <laughs> yeah, it's totally hard not to scroll. And so the community that you're building is there, or, or, you know, do you have plans to support women in, in this respect too? Because I know when our family was going gluten-free, when we were eliminating sugar, I eliminated caffeine last year. So I, oh, wow. I said at the beginning of this thing, you know, it's just like us all having coffee together, but for me, it's water not coffee because you know I've eliminated that too but that's not easy and so I feel like your community could could be somewhat of a support group for you know everybody being accountable and and checking in with each other and supporting each other on these these ways of life that may make chronic illness and the the chronic situations that you're having a little bit easier to deal with yeah I think some of that for for sure and I think some of that just some like camaraderie with like the the like with that woman's the 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 mother's load right like that stuff that we have to carry that nobody talks about so that's just like the chronic illness load right like just some acknowledgement that like that is taking some energy away that is taking some time away um just to even know that caffeine could be an influencer and like maybe that's helpful just the fact of like searching for that information like just an honoring and acknowledging of like that your experience is seen and that those types of things are something you're holding and carrying and you're not alone in that, I think helps too. And also, uh, oh, sorry, Jenny. Sorry, you go ahead. I was just going to say also when you're transitioning to being caffeine free or whatever, well, maybe not as an example, caffeine free, but say gluten free, right? It's hard because gluten's in a million things. And so maybe even just recipes or tried and true. Hey, this works for the entire family, not just you. Because as a mom, now you have to, are you making a meal separate for you and then a meal for the family? So I think there is a lot, even in just changing your diet that goes into being a mom and in that transition. And I think that really speaks to, like, yeah, like that's something that's really difficult for me is like, that's a lot to take on, right? Like I'm cooking for me, I'm cooking for my family. And just to be able to say like, that's a lot of work. (laughs) This is a lot of work. This is hard. (laughs) Even just that is still, um, sometimes it's hard to say as a mom, like it's hard to say, I'm overwhelmed. (laughs) I'm struggling. This is a lot to do. And just to have that community of people that will say that and be like, oh yeah. And these are some hacks I'm finding that help with that. But um, yeah. <laughs> I can totally relate on the diet thing. Um, about two years ago, I discovered I am dairy and egg intolerant, um, a- along with a few other things, but the dairy and egg were the most, um, the hardest to avoid I found. Um, and just, you know, my kids would have their, their milk and everything and eggs are in everything. And I remember just crying. I would sit there and think like, I don't know even how to make dinner anymore. I don't know. Like the family are, we would always get up on Sunday mornings and go for a bike ride and go to a breakfast restaurant and eat breakfast. And I remember just sitting there and crying one day because it was like, I can't even go. Like I'm going to go and watch you guys eat and I can get like a bowl of fruit or something. And I, you know, it was this little pity party on my own self, but it's such a hard transition and you almost have to relearn how to cook 
where you can go out to eat, what what foods you can't eat and what you can have. Um, and it's it's really, really hard. And you know, with it affecting your life so much, I can imagine you struggled as well, um, you know, relearning how to eat. Yeah, and that's such a good example of like, yeah, like this is so, like the food, right, is such a good example of the ways that chronic illness like show up in our lives. So whether it's mobility, whether it's food, whether it's sleep, or it, it's just, it's everywhere and it's so unseen and it's so invisible, but it's something you carry, right? Like you're relearning how to cook for your family or relearning how to cook for yourself. And I don't know about you when you were going through that, but for me, sometimes I end up, I end up not eating. Like I end up like, it's just by the time this goes to the spoons thing too, like dealing with like chronic pain and fatigue by the time I got done making everyone else's food, I'm just like, I'm too tired. <laughs> like, I'm just, it's too, it, it became too much. So I think a community to help people, like, gather information from each other to find ways to make this whole experience um, easier, <laughs> I think would, is helpful. Uh, but the easiest thing is just acknowledging it's happening in the first place. <laughs> um, yeah. Have you found, and now I know you started Same Here Mama because there was a need for this, but, or a need for support, but have you found any other ways of like something that was already established, any other support groups or any other community or anything for moms that have suffered through what you've suffered through? Honestly, I I'd hate to say, nope, nothing. And then I'm, someone come back and they're going to be like, wait, what about this? <laughs> So I don't think so. I think that uh, lots of other like mom communities where, um, so there's other mom communities and that's like life-saving. That's like, I don't know, to me it is. That's like a lifeline is when you're like, oh, it's not just me. So for me, like just that there are other groups specific to like whatever it is you're going through. Um, that are that are out there to me I just didn't even know that was out there like it didn't I didn't even know to think one because shame will make things hidden right like so and we're already in a silo so we're in a silo and then there's shame and so then we're like there can't possibly be other people experiencing this um so just knowing that there are and that um that there, there might be groups out there even specific to your specific experience. So I'm, I guess I'm shocked that however many doctors you've seen throughout the last 20 years that you've been dealing with this, haven't had any suggestions or has any, or maybe they have, um, has, have any of your doctors suggested, you know, maybe, and I'm not saying this is something that you need, but I'm, but I know that other moms do, um, like seeing a counselor or something like that to help with that shame and to help get out from underneath that. Well, I think the the issue there is like for so long, um, how do I say this? Like, <laughs> like um, for so long, the anxiety was used as a way to dismiss the actual issue. So like, you don't have anything physically wrong with you. You're anxious, you're psychosomatic, you're um, like, this is just, I've been told so many times in that whole journey, like you're just an anxious mother. You're just a tired mother. You just had a baby. Like, so in order for someone to suggest something as a support for the actual physical illness, it has to even be acknowledged in the first place. So I think that now on the other end of it, right? So like 20 years later or like along the way, but I think the counseling came first um, because the counseling, well, one, I've <laughs> We are struggling with OCD and anxiety. So like counseling is like clutch there. Like, um, But also to have counselors be, I mean, I have a counselor that like helps guide with the chronic illness and, and helps counsel in that way. Um, and that's been very helpful um, 
dealing with trauma counseling is very helpful. Um, there's a lot of like components of medical trauma that are embedded in my story and unpacking that and um, it's EMDR counseling. So I think that those things are very helpful. But I think the reason I, uh, I think I almost have a visceral response <laughs> because I think that it's really common for, for women to be told like, this is all in your head or this is a man those physical symptoms are a manifestation of your anxiety. And so I, um, when it, it could be not the case, <laughs> it could be connected to the physical problem. So. I saw on your Instagram page that you use the, the term spoonie. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about what that means? Um, and, and, uh, where that word comes from? Yes. So I learned Spoonie actually from a friend. So this is like how I think I feel like in community, this is how we learn about things, all things chronic illness. So um, two friends actually. Um, so spoon theory, a Spoonie is like a term that people use to call themselves or call others who have chronic illnesses within the chronic illness community. Um, so it, it's a term that we kind of like use for ourselves <laughs> or use to, um, yeah. Uh, but it comes from spoon theory, which I totally wrote down the name of the woman and I will find it at some point because my screen went out, but it um, was created, spoon theory was created by a woman who was trying to explain chronic, what it was like to live with chronic illness to a friend and she used spoons as uh, like an example. And she said, we're given um, X amount of spoons within a day and um, you have to manage your day with just those spoons. So and try not to run out. So like washing your hair could be two spoons, a doctor's appointment could be five spoons. Um, deal, you know, like navigating motherhood and kids stuff, for me that's like a lot of spoons because my kids are young, it's really physically demanding. So that's spoon theory and that's kind of what being a spoon is. <laughs> that makes so much sense. Um, so then to follow up on that, now that you understand, you know, you have the proper diagnosis and you understand how, you know, being a mom, it, it can be exhausting. And, and as you said, you only have so many spoons to get you through that whole day. How do you manage being a mom um, and not running out of spoons and actually getting through your day? Sometimes you just run out. <laughs> that's just the, like, that's the legit truth. Like sometimes you borrow from other days. Sometimes you try and, um, use planning to like, I call it like spoon negotiation, like, <laughs> like, uh, like a spoon hostage negotiation. So sometimes I am just sacrificing uh, that I know I'm going to be in pain later. Or I know I'm going to be really depleted later because the thing I'm doing is kind of worth that, but I know it's happening. Like when other times I just am going throughout my day and it's like, I got a lot of spoons that day. And so I'm using them, using them. And then the next day I have a negative amount of spoons. So I'm, I've been working on using a planner a lot to try and negotiate like what I'm doing in my day so I can try and have more reserves and, and not burn myself out on days that I find are low pain days or my symptoms are fluctuating or I have more energy. So trying to manage that a little bit better, but life just happens. And sometimes you're just in like this constant negotiation with it. So now that you're a bit more familiar with what's going on with you and you've worked through what you've worked through, um, I know that your diet's changed and you've, you've done, you know, changed some things like that, but, but has life changed for you at all? Do you, um, look at your week and say, well, I know I need one full day, you know, or as, as to myself as I can have it. Cause I know you have little kids and that's really tough, but do you build rest into your week more? Like how do you anticipate kind of what the week's going to go like so that you can create those opportunities for you to, to, to fill your tank, basically. That's like legit what I'm working on. Like I have like planners now that I'm starting to map out what activities take more energy than other activities and kind of shifting things. But that's really new for us. That's really, and I say us because like chronic illness is a family game. Like this affects my husband. This affects my kids. This affects our entire life ecosystem, like our entire family ecosystem. So um, it, it's new 
to be, it's new to be this symptomatic. Like I haven't in the 20 years, I haven't been this symptomatic. So that, that in of itself has been a four year journey of navigating with our family. Like I can't do that. So even that is new to say like, I can't, I can't do that today. I can't, I have to sit now. Just that basic thing of saying like, mommy needs to sit right now. Um, and to even just give myself that kind of grace and say like, it's, it's okay if I just sit down for five minutes. Um, so I wish I had like a better, more, more perfect system for that. Or like, it's just, it's really tough. And it's something I'm really working on is to, to now adjust my, it's almost like getting the diagnoses. It shouldn't have taken getting them for me to say, I need to rest or my body can't do that. Um, I even saw an amazing post about mobility devices and um, this woman posted something so wise and so powerful. And it was like, well, how do you know when you need a mobility device? And she's like, whenever you want, <laughs> whenever you think that that will help you, whenever, however, you don't need anyone's permission. You don't need a diagnosis. If you think that that will help you, that will help you. And I, I, I want to get a chair for my kitchen because it's really hard to cook. And it, I, it, I'm in a lot of pain, but we're taught to kind of plow through our pain a lot. So just got to adjust to it, I guess, <laughs> adjust yeah. to the need for these things. Absolutely. I totally get what you're saying. And I, I honestly love what you said about, you know, sometimes I just need to sit down and I give myself that grace and I just tell my son, you know, Hey mom, mom just needs to sit down for five minutes or whatever. And I feel like that is in a way teaching them to give themselves, you know, to give themselves the grace too, because I mean, this kind of thing could be genetic, right? And, and so potentially yeah. they could deal with it themselves physically. I mean, I know it's a, it's a family thing and they are dealing with it at this point in time, but they may be dealing with it themselves physically too. And how wonderful is it to teach our children to give themselves that grace or maybe, you know, their significant other later on in life, or maybe a child or somebody is going to have this, this potentially type of, of issue going on. And, and how awesome is it to, teach our children to be sensitive to that. So I, I love that. Yeah, I totally, totally agree with you. That's been like this, like when we say like what positive can come from this, like that's a huge positive, a huge positive. Like I may never have slowed down. <laughs> I may never have said like, I need to rest. What is the word rest? <laughs> to teach my children about rest, to teach my children about self-compassion, to teach them about um having balance in life between work and play and, and, and pacing yourself. Like, I don't know. So I think it's really powerful for, for our kids. Or even the fact that our health is important. Cause I think yeah. moms do that a lot of times, right? Like you're not worried about yourself. I never go to the doctor. I always make sure my kids are, but stepping back, like Katie was saying, what we do and they emulate us. So what we do is definitely directly teaching them life lessons. Um, and so just being able to show them that our health is important because if we're not healthy, we can't take care of them. That's such a good point. That's the stuff to remember when you're like, I, I have an enormous amount of guilt. Like when I take care of myself or for like pursuing, which is, that's crazy, but I have a lot of guilt for just pursuing my health <laughs> to get healthy. So I'm going to take that today too. Like that's a good reminder to be like, no, it's important for many reasons. So thank you. <laughs> Jenny, were you going to say something? I see your, you have the, I'm going to say something face. I do. Well, I was actually, I was going to ask um, if there's a silver lining to this and you kind of already answered it. So then I was like, I, I don't know if I even asked that anymore, <laughs> but it sounds like you have found a silver lining just in the fact that you're taking care of yourself um, and maybe slowing down and appreciating things a little bit more um, rather than just, you know, a lot of us live such a busy life. Um, and so maybe that is your silver lining. I think, yeah, I think that's a huge one. I think like, yeah, I think that's huge actually. I think you put that really well. <laughs> Yeah, I agree too. Is there anything that if you could give a message to 
moms across the world that are dealing with what you're dealing with, what would you want others to know about being a mom with a chronic condition? Uh, that you are not alone by any means. Um, I wrote this down. You're as important and I can't find it. <laughs> um, just that you're not alone. This is not in your mind. Um, you are managing another job. And so if it feels that way, it's because you are. <laughs> um, and to kind of making those unseen things seen. Uh, and, to, and even to just like inventory all the things you are managing. So in those days when it seems like it's impossible, it's because it is really hard. Um, it's not that you're failing at motherhood. Um, it's that it is that difficult to manage a chronic illness or any kind of chronic condition and navigate motherhood. Um, so that's on the motherhood side of things. And you're doing a great job. All of it. You're just doing a great job. <laughs> I think that's so huge because it's so easy for us to compare our, our insides to other people's outsides, right? And so yeah. it's an age old thing. This is nothing new. Everybody knows about this. We're only seeing people's highlight reels on social media and things like that. And we're not really seeing what happens on a daily basis or what's going on behind the scenes. And I feel like often, you know, I find catch myself doing that, like, oh, wow, she seems really successful or, oh, wow, she has a lot of friends or, oh, wow, she's really skinny or whatever it is. You know what I mean? And I find myself comparing to what I'm seeing and it could be filtered 47 times and it could have been the only one sane second that mom had that moment, but I don't know that. Right. You know what I mean? And yeah. here I am, and I think we naturally kind of do this, unfortunately, but I think we naturally kind of, you know, square ourselves up to others and, and then start beating ourselves up because we don't match up. And what are we even matching up to? Or what do we, you know, like, it, it's such a crazy game once you start, once you jump down that hole. Yeah, I totally, and it's so interesting because like, that's the whole social media thing is like, I love that we put that, what are we matching up to? Because social media is really powerful. Like that community is an, is an incredible platform for advocacy work, um, for making social change. It's an incredible platform. Um, but that is so powerful. You said like, what are we matching it up to? Because to take that and use that as our like self barometer about mm -hmm. how well we're doing, like that's the pro, like that's where I do that all the time. And it is insidious. Like, um, so I don't know how we don't do that. I, I don't know. How do we not do that? <laughs> right. But right. The platform itself is, is needed and it's important, but how do we not let it do that to us? I don't know. With more women like you that creates a safe place for women to go that can be uplifted and can be supportive and can hear from other women that, Hey man, it's hard for me too. Like, don't just look at my smiling face because that was that one split second I got my kid to listen and I actually felt well enough to take a selfie or whatever it is. Yeah, I do. And I, I love that. I do feel like there's so many more voices in that, in that space that are talking like that and saying those things and being really real about motherhood in that way. And, um, that inspires me to feel safe to do that as well. And so, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> oh. Jess, it was so, is it okay if I call you Jess? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Okay. Do, do yeah. people normally call you Jess? Cause I, they do. Yeah. I, people, shorten. people close to me or people, yeah, they call me Jess. Okay, good. Cause I yeah. shorten everybody's name, whether they like it or not. So figure like it out. It. <laughs> so <laughs> awesome. I like it. Well, it was, it, it, ladies, am I cutting you off? Did you have any other questions for Jess? No, it was an absolute pleasure having you on. What an inspirational story. I am like, my heart is so full. I am so happy for you that you've found some answers, that you're on that journey of, of you know, wellness and you have, um, I'm sure a wonderful support system around you. I know your hubby, so I know he's really awesome. And I'm sure he's absolutely wonderful to you. Um, and, and that is amazing. I, I think you're really on to something and um, I'm, I'm excited to watch this community flourish. So if uh, a mama that's listening would like to connect with you, what's the best way that they can do that? The best way right now is through Instagram. So it's through um, Instagram at same here mama. Um, and that's the best way. Yeah. <laughs>
Awesome. And is it okay if I throw that in the show notes here when we're done? So then yeah, that absolutely. way it can be easy to click. Awesome. I will do yeah, that. Well, thank you so much, Jess. Thank you so much for allowing me this space to share this story and to share other this experience that lots of other mamas are going through. So thank you so much. Absolutely. It was great having you. All right, ladies, we're going to wrap it up here. So what do we want everybody to do? They're looking at each other like, are you going? Are you going? Go ahead, Jenny. <laughs> we want you to subscribe to our podcast. Um, you can go to Google Podcast for our, my Android users and um, iTunes <laughs> and follow us so that you can see when we have a new episode and download those episodes and please give us a five-star review. Yes, yeah. please. That was absolutely perfect. And I don't, I, I really honestly love all people, whether you're an Android user or not, just Jenny kind of, and I have this little rivalry, uh, rivalry, because you know, she's green and I'm blue. And anyways, <laughs> we had one of those fights in the group the other, remember it was a couple months ago when it was like Android or iPhone. I don't remember who won. We let everybody vote. That was kind of funny. <laughs> But anyways, guys, all right. Well, it's been real. It's been wonderful seeing all of your beautiful faces. Thank you again, Jess. Please tell everybody we said hello. And uh, you. we'll see you next time, guys. Thank you guys so much. Have a good week. Bye, you, you too. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Thanks.